Welcome to LiTex Assistive Technology for Photography Online Learning Session. My name is Dennis. I'm one of the health professionals here at LiveTech. And for those who may not have heard of us LiveTech or engaged in our services before, um, I guess I'll just give you guys a bit of an introduction of who we are and what we do. So LiveTech is a social enterprise that provides information education and advice on assistive technologies. Now you may be wondering what exactly does the term assistive technologies mean? Assistive technologies refers to devices or designs or even just ideas that helps people to either perform a task that they previously is unable to do so, or for those who may um, find it difficult or uncomfortable to do um, certain activities, um, assistive technologies can also help them to um, perform such tasks easier or safer. So with assistive technologies, one can um, obviously continue to um, look into or participate in things that they love. For example, assistive technologies can be applied in areas such as sports, recreational activities. It may also involve vocational aids or workplace modification, things that assist people to communicate and share their ideas with others, and even vehicle modifications that allows one to um, be independence in terms of their mobility. And it also includes things as simple as telecommunication tools that is a bit easier to use than um, the normal telephone. And sometimes the easiest or simplest ideas are the best. For example, a sock donor can be really useful for someone who may have a bad hip or have difficulty bending um, to get their socks on. We are leaders in the forefront of assistive technology itself through education, research, and partnership. And our health professionals here enable solutions through our in interactive display centers, both in Brisbane and Townsville. We do have an inquiries hotline as well. Um, so if you have any um, questions or anything like that, you can also give us a call at 1-300-885. 886. And we do have our outreach services as well. So for those who are not living um, in the Southeast Queensland or North Queensland region, we do come out to every single part of Queensland at least once a year. And we also are looking, um, are working on our telehealth consult services as well so that people can still have equitable access, um, even though they may not be um, within the Southeast Queensland or North Queensland region, and it also helps um, you to access our services a lot of time, um, a lot quicker as well as compared to say um, seeing us on one of our outreach services. We also provide obviously clients and professional education services as well. So we do run regular talks, online learning modules, as well as things like um, community presentations and professional development sessions as well for um, different clients groups as well as different professionals. And our website is really helpful, um, especially for those who may not um, have been on our website before. You can find a lot of information there, whether it is our quarterly review, which is our newsletter, as well as some information um, fact sheets for on different assistive technology, all the way from things as simple as um, gardening aids all the way to um, home modifications. And for if you are looking into um, items that or assistive technology that is of a certain area or to help you with a certain task, but you are not sure where to start with, um, we do have a, our product database on our website as well, which is fantastic. And it gives you um, 
a good idea in terms of what is available in the market for this particular area. And also it allows you to start looking into different features as well as different um, supplier contact details as well in regards to those assistive technologies that you may be looking into. You can also find our outreach schedule as well as our education calendar there as well. So that allows you to that allows you to have a look into where we will be at um, in different um, in different regions throughout the year, as well as um, obviously when our professional development sessions or education events are going to be as well. So without further ado. Um, as I mentioned before, today's session is on assistive technology for photography. Now, there isn't really a huge amount of research that is being done in this area, and there isn't really a huge amount of specialized equipment that is available in the area of photography as well. So what we will be looking at today is to um, look for features and also some of the designs that is available in mainstream technology that would be really useful for someone who may be looking for um, accessing photography um, as their hobby or as, um, or as something that they would like to pursue further. I guess before we start, there are a few things that we do need to clarify. Firstly, it is how a camera works. A camera is a bit like our eyes. So you have a subject, which is the things that you want to take. In this scenario, it is the person. And what it does is the camera capture the image through a set of lens, which then pass through the aperture and the shutter. And at the end of the day, the light from the subject is being projected on a set of the sensor or film, depending on the type of camera that you are using. So if you are using a digital camera, obviously that will become a digital image sensor instead of a film. But if you are using a film camera, then that will be what you have there. So for those who, don't, um, who haven't really looked into these things before, Basically, the lens allows you to modify um, the image, whether it is to magnify or to to make the image become a bit smaller. Um, and the aperture itself controls the amount of light that enters the camera itself. So remember aperture, which acts a bit like um, think of it as a water tap that controls how much light can flow through the camera. While the shutter controls how long the sensor is being exposed to those lights. So as we, as we look into a few things, um, these terms will come up again and again. So, um, if you have any questions, um, or if you're not too sure about that, um, do feel free to um, come back to this segment so that you can have a look into that. I guess one of the biggest difficulty that um, a lot of us face, even for um, those who may not have any um, any physical condition, um, any conditions that may affect us from physically operating the camera, it's something like this, where we may not be able to stabilize a camera when we are taking photo. Now, that can be caused by quite a few different factors, but most of that falls between these three different factors. Firstly, shutter speed. Secondly, aperture size. And the third one is obviously how sensitive the sensor is. As we, sub as we physically support a camera and take a photo, um, in order to prevent something that is blurry 
or something that looks like as if it is moving, we do need to maintain the camera in a in a relatively stationary position. However, as we hold on to our camera, there are actually quite a few different forces that are in play. As illustrated here, what we need to do is not just prevent the camera from moving vertically and horizontally, but also to deal with the pitch, yaw, and rolling of the camera as, as well. So there are actually a lot of movements involved, even though it may not seem to be the case um, when you are just holding onto a camera. In order to reduce the likelihood of a blurry photo, what one can do is to change some of the parameters around the three factors that I've mentioned before sensor sensitivity, aperture size, and shutter speed. So you may be wondering what exactly that means. Basically, sensor sensitivity is how sensitive the sensor is to light, or how much light it is recording um, during the exposure. And the higher the sensor sensitivity it is, then the less amount of time is needed for the sensor to complete a properly exposed photo. And that also means that if you have minor tremors, having a camera that can allow you to go up to higher ISO sensitivities may be a good idea because that helps you to, um, that means that you do not need to stabilize the camera for as long as um, for as long as some of those that may have lower uh, um, lower sensor sensitivity itself. And there are lots of different cameras that allows you to um, have high ISO sensitivity or high sensor sensitivity these days. So it is definitely a feature that you want to look into when you are selecting a camera if you have minor tremors in your hand. The other thing that you can change um, or you can look into is the aperture size of the lens as well. Usually they are being denoted, um, usually they're denoted by a F number. And the smaller the number is, the larger the aperture is. Say, for example, as you can see here, the size between F2 and F4 is actually quite substantial. And it, and it allows you a much larger amount of light to come into the camera itself. And again, this means that you don't have to hold on to the camera in the stationary position for as long um, for extended period of time in these regards. However, this does have some drawbacks for both increasing ISO sensitivity or having larger aperture lens. So firstly, for those who are looking into using high ISO sensitivities, what you will notice is that your photos will become grainier as you increase the sensitivity of the sensor. In terms of large aperture lenses, you will also notice that as your lens's aperture increases, the size and weight of them also increases as well um, from the equivalent. So for example, um, something that may have an F2.8 will be will be substantially heavier and bulkier than a lens where the maximum aperture is only f5.6. That is because of the amount of glass that is required in those lenses. So that is definitely one of the drawbacks. And the other drawback is usually large aperture lenses. Their prices also increase exponentially as well. So that is 
definitely factors that you do need to um, consider when you're looking into these solutions. The other option that you may notice is that there are lots of cameras these days that have built in optical or sensor stabilization systems. So what it does is that in each of these cameras, they have an acceleration and gyrometer in them. And as they detect movements like tremor or unwanted movement when you are when you are exposing a photo or when the shutter is open, then the sensor will move or the lens will move accordingly to prevent those tremors from affecting the final image output. And that can be quite useful if you have minor tremors um, combined with the previous mentioned strategies. They can be um, they can really minimize the amount of impact by, say, some of the minor tremors that one may have as they take photos. Obviously, um, this will, um, all these strategies will only work if we are talking about a really minor level of movement. For some of us, it may be important for us to actually get external support for your camera so that it is stable, um, so that it is in a stable and stationary position. Obviously, one can use tripod, um, but they can be bulky and difficult to set up. There are also lightweight tripod or mini tripod these days where you can set up on other items as well instead of on the ground. So that's definitely something worth considering if you are looking into um, obviously working with someone or if you have um, larger amounts of tremors that cannot be tackled by what is built into your camera itself. Other than that, there are also different type of mountings that is designed for people who may be using mobility aids or wheelchairs. For example, um, some of the suppliers in Australia actually supplies things like wheelchair mounted or clam mounted um, camera support. So for example, the one on the left um, allows you to clamp onto a standard wheelchair frame and of course you still have a camera mount that can be panned um, using the lever here as well. What it does is it allows the person to have their camera mounted on their wheelchair, and as they move their wheelchair, they can also change the position of the camera as well. And that enables them to be able to take some of the photos um, without having need to physically supporting the camera itself. All they need to do is to position the camera um, in front of the things that they want to take, and then obviously press the shutter button itself without having need to worry about, say, for example, um, holding the camera and those things as they take the photo. There are also different types of mounting as well. For example, the one on the right-hand side is a gooseneck mount that can also be adapted to, to use with a camera as well. But you may be wondering, what about those who may not um, be able to use their hand to reposition their camera? There are also other options as well. For example, um, especially these days with things like GoPro or action cameras, you'll notice that there are lots of head mounting that is available for um, whether it is video cameras or still cameras. So the idea behind it is that you can have that mounted on things like a helmet or a hat, and the person can then position the camera via moving their head. The drawback of this is obviously you cannot see what exactly the camera is taking, but because of the close proximity 
um, to the person's eyes, generally it will not vary as much as we expect it to be. There is also other options as well. For those who may have difficulty seeing what is happening on the viewfinder, or for those who may have difficulty controlling some of the controls on a camera, there are also auto framing features as well these days. For example, some of the cameras, you may be able to use things like an automatic portrait mode, which allows the person to take a photo and then the camera itself will reposition the photo and then and also cropping things that may not be necessary um, for the photo um, for the photo so that the subject can be a lot more prominent or clearer. Say for example something like this. So as you as the camera takes the photo, it will automatically select the best proportion for a portrait. And then as you can see, the outcome becomes a lot closer to a professional um, portrait itself when it comes to framing. So that can be quite useful for those who may have difficulty operating some of the controls on the camera itself. Obviously, if you are looking into cameras, one of the difficulties that people may face is that the buttons and the control interfaces can be very difficult to access physically, especially with um, a lot of cameras these days are aiming to be to become smaller. As a result of that, a lot of them comes with small buttons or things that may not be very um, or buttons that are very close to each other. And as a result of that, it can be um, quite challenging for someone who may have, say, tremors in their hands or may have some fine motor difficulties as well to operate cameras like that. So there are different, obviously, different cameras out there. But there are also large buttons cameras these days as well. So for those who may have difficulty targeting small buttons or seeing small buttons, um, cameras such as some of these large button designs can be really useful. So for example, the camera that you're seeing here has not just a large on-off button in the middle, but also has large shutter button um, on the right-hand side for taking photos and a large video recording button on the left hand side as well. And at the back, you still have large navigational buttons, which can be really useful for someone who may have difficulty working with smaller controls. Now you may be thinking, what if I have difficulty using even something like that? or if I have, or if I'm working with a client who may have physical difficulties um, and find direct access really challenging. There are also solutions for these, um, for these scenarios as well. So for example, um, some of the local suppliers um, actually supply switch adapted um, cameras which allows the person to operate um, a standard digital camera via one or two switches. So what it does is it allows the person to take obviously photos um, via that, but it also um, some of them also allows some of them also allow the person to control the zoom or focus via these switches as well. So that is the more specialist solution, I suppose, um, in this regard. However, um, we also need to remember that there are actually a lot of cameras 
that comes with remote controls um, so that people can use that to take their own photos. And some of these remote controls uses infrared signals. What it means is that the remote control itself transmits an infrared signal to the camera, and with that, the camera will then be able to ex execute the commands from the remote control itself, whether it is taking a photo or, say, for example, performing certain tasks like zooming the lens and so on and so forth. With that in mind, um, if you are if you are currently using a camera that has infrared receiver, that also means that you can potentially use an environmental control unit to control the camera that you are using. This allows you to program in those infrared codes onto the environmental control unit. And if you, are, if you already have a suitable access option for the environmental control unit, you can then access that via your usual means. Or for those who may not have used an environmental control unit before, they can be, um, they can be operated with, for example, a switch or even some of that, the more computerized system allows you to use different mouse options as well in conjunction with the environmental control unit. So you may be wondering, how can I know where, whether the camera that I'm looking at will have an infrared receiver or will have those features that you are looking for? One of the options that I have I've noticed is a website called Neo Camera. So it is a database of all the cameras that is currently available in the market. And what it does is that it lists out all the different features and also um, their specifications as well on a camera. So let me show you how that works. So once you have entered their website, all you need to do is to click on camera search. In this scenario, especially for someone who may have difficulty operating the, in, the interface of a camera, I would suggest you to potentially look into a camera where you may have fixed lens attachment. That means the lens is not interchangeable, but that also means that a lot of times you will find additional controls that can be used via remote control or environmental control unit, um, say, for example, zooming and those features because the lens is integrated into the camera itself. So once you have selected that, all you need to do is to press the button search. And it will list out all the cameras that, is, that meet those criteria in the market. And remember what we want to do is to look for cameras that have infrared remote control capabilities. So what we need to do is to scroll down all the way. And you will notice a segment called Other Options. And one of those options is infrared remote. So as you click on that, it will then filter out all the cameras that have the ability to use an external infrared remote itself. So let me show you where it is. So as you can see here, remote trigger infrared. And that means all these cameras here will have the ability to accept infrared signals from either a purpose-built remote control or a or a and or an infrared signal from 
an environmental control unit itself. So that can be really useful if you are looking at some of those cameras yourself or for your clients. Another option when it comes to taking photos these days, obviously, is the use of a smartphone. And that also opens up a huge amount of access options for those who may have difficulty using a standard camera as well. For example, if you are currently using um, a smartphone, some of them allows you to use external access devices to access obviously the features of a smartphone itself. So whether it is things like the joystick on your wheelchair or whether it is other alternative access options. So for example, if you are currently using an Android mobile phone, you can then use things like a, a wheelchair controller, which also allows you to emulate a Bluetooth mouse, or for some of the other mobile phones that support external USB devices, you can also plug in different mouse options on it as well. And that means the person can then control, say for example, their phone, which is also their camera, via these devices. Now, with most of the mobile phone cameras, people may find that somewhat limiting when it comes to things and features that they can adjust or control. And obviously, because of the fact that these are designed not exactly to be a professional camera, um, the controls can be quite limiting um, when it comes to things like customizations that are available um, or settings that one can change. Interestingly, in the recent years, there are also cameras which are designed um, purposely as a digital camera, not a phone, that can interface with mobile phones as well. Say, for example, this camera here on the right-hand side of the screen, it, al it allows the user to control it via their mobile phone using Wi-Fi. So what it does, what it means is that the person who is using the camera and the mobile phone can see what the camera sees on the mobile phone itself, but at the same time it also gives them the ability to control a lot of the parameters of the camera at the same time via their mobile phones. For example, the person can adjust things like the aperture size, ISO sensitivity, shutter speed, white balance, and even some of the some of the other features like mode and so on and so forth as well on their camera. Which is all well and good, um, especially if you uh, if you are currently using this type of alternative access method. Um, to access your mobile phone or telecommunication devices. This means that you can then use the same access method to access a camera as well. Although there are still some limitations there. Say for example, if you want to, if you want to zoom into some of the things that is in front of you, um, on cameras like these type of traditional cameras, you either have to manually turn the barrel of the lens or you will have to interact with the controls on the camera itself, which is going to be difficult um, or challenging for some people. Interestingly, there are also cameras that is specifically designed for use with mobile phones these days as well. So instead of 
being able um, instead of using it or as a camera that is designed to be used as a standalone camera. These cameras are designed to be an accessory of a mobile phone. And what it means is that in terms of control wise, it is very similar to the previous scenario where people can use their current access methods to control their mobile phone, which in turn control the camera. This may sound similar to the scenario that we were talking about just now. But because of the fact that these cameras are designed not to be a standalone camera, but something to work with a mobile phone itself. This means that it has a lot more control to the user on the mobile phone interface. For example, um, in this particular camera that we see here, the person can not just control things like the aperture size of the lens or exposure compensation or shutter speed and those kind of things. It also allows the person to change from different modes or change between different modes of the cameras as well. But most importantly, it allows the person to also have control of the optical zooming of the camera. This means that the person, as long as they have access to their mobile phone, they can access all the features that they may want to use on the standard camera itself. They can even use that for full manual control if needed. So that is definitely quite a plus for those who love to do photography but have difficulty accessing a standard camera interface. Obviously, there are also some other options that is available as well when it comes to these type of cameras. So you do have to make sure that um, they provide you with the suitable controls that you want to have um, in the applications um, that is designed to work with these cameras. As compared to say, just go out and buy a camera, it, this may be a bit, um, this may require a little bit more research, but definitely it is something that is worth it if you are looking into, um, if, you're, if you want to do some serious photography yourself. I guess the other area is to look into wearable devices as well and how can they be used um, for photography itself. Say for example, um, for those who may not um, have heard of wearable technologies, basically that means things that we can wear on our body, for example like watches or glasses or some other type of um, display that um, can interact with other smart devices. One of the examples that is there is Google Glass, which is a which is a small um, display that can be placed in front of a person as a head-up display. Um, but at the same time, it also has a camera that is integrated into it as well. What it means is that this particular device can be worn by someone who may have difficulty say um, physically accessing the, a device or controlling or stabilizing a camera is, uh, um, himself or herself and through that they can then have the camera that is quite close to their eyes and at the same time the camera is also voice activated and that means the person can say take a picture to take a picture themselves. And you can also find some of these features on some of the smartphones these days. Say, for example, some of them may have what they call smile or cheese shutter, so that 
when the camera detected someone smiles or when they detected a key phrase, like take a picture, the camera itself will then take a picture. So these are some of the alternative methods to access a camera itself, um, whether you're using something like a pair of Google Glass or whether you are looking into using some voice activated um, camera applications that is on your smartphone. These are definitely um, things that is worth looking into if you have difficulty accessing a standard camera interface physically. Obviously, there are still a lot of new developments out there, um, and it is an exciting space um, in terms of assistive technology, especially with all the new developments in both mainstream and specialist technologies these days. Before I close today's, um, I end with today's session, I just want to um, give you guys an open invitation to our display center as well, both in Brisbane and in Townsville. As I mentioned previously, um, we do have two display centers in Brisbane and Townsville. Um, for the one in Brisbane, we are located in Reading New Market, which is just north of Kelvin Grove. So if you are traveling from the city, it is actually quite close to it. And for those who are in the North Queensland region, we are located in Townsville, um, which is in Domain Central. Um, again, quite a large um, shopping center, and it is also very close to the city area as well for those who are looking into traveling to it. You also have our numbers, um, our phone numbers here as well. So if you have any inquiries or so on, you are more than welcome to give us a call at 1300. 885-886. Alternatively, you can also email us at mail at lifetech.org.au. So if you have any inquiries in terms of assistive technologies or even contents that we have discussed today, you are more than welcome to get in touch with us and we will try to provide you the information or answer the questions that you may have. Um, as much as we can. So just want to once again say thank you for your participation in this online learning session, and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Bye.